You're listening to Knowledge at Wharton on Business Radio. Here again is Dan Loney. Welcome back. Hour number two of Knowledge at Wharton here on Sirius XM 132 Business Radio, powered by the Wharton School. Great to have you joining us. It is the 21st of August, coming to you from Philadelphia and the campus of the University of Pennsylvania. Coming up here in the second hour of our show in just a minute, we will have our number of the day. And then we're going to be joined by Ian Urbina, uh, author of the new book, The Outlaw Ocean, uh, which looks at some of the illegal activity going on in our high seas or on the high seas uh, around the planet. Uh, a variety of things that are going on, more so than maybe a lot of people would even uh, believe. Uh, but uh, the bigger issue may be the fact that there's really nobody out there doing much to stop some of this activity. We'll talk about that coming up in just a minute. And then in our final 30, immigration be- uh, continues to be an important topic here in the United States. Uh, changes, potential changes to immigration policy uh, are on the minds of a lot of people. The Penn Wharton budget model dug deeper into this topic and looked at what the impact would be on the U.S. economy if certain policy changes were made around immigration. We'll talk about that report coming up at 1130 Eastern Time. All of that over the next uh, hour of our show. The way for you to join in is either by phone at 844-WHARTON, 844-942-7866. Or if you'd like, send us a comment on Twitter at BizRadio132 or my Twitter account, which is at DanLoney21. First, though, our number of the day, which is 936. You may have seen this story pop up, uh, but important to take note of it, especially considering the discussion we're having here in the United States right now around uh, social media and social media companies like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and the like. Uh, Twitter disclosed that it has removed 936 accounts and suspended approximately 200,000 accounts uh, after an investigation uh, originating from within the People's Republic of China, finding a significant state-backed information operation that was targeting the pro-democracy movement in Hong Kong. Obviously, quite a bit of uh, of uh, protesting going on uh, in Hong Kong over the last few weeks, uh, last couple of months. But it is uh, interesting to note that Twitter actually is taking a deeper dive into this and the fact that they have removed accounts and suspended some because of this information being send, sent out on social media that is ending up on the feeds of people in Hong Kong. 936, our number of the day, the number of accounts that Twitter has removed to go along with the 200,000 suspended because of significant state-backed information operation originating from within the People's Republic of China targeting the pro-democracy movement in Hong Kong. The oceans cover 71% of the Earth's surface. An estimated 90% of the world's goods are transported across them by boats and ships. Yet what is perhaps our last frontier remains wild and a little understood, making it ripe for criminal activity. Traffickers, smugglers, pirates, and mercenaries roam the seas as international laws and authorities remain unable to cover all 140 million square miles of open water. Back in 2015, the New York Times featured a series about those who operate in this largely lawless world. It was written by our next guest, Ian Urbina. That series is the basis of his new book, The Outlaw Ocean, Journeys Across the Last Untamed Frontier. Urbina is an investigative reporter and contributing writer for The Atlantic. He won a Pulitzer Prize for Breaking News in 2009 and the George Polk Award for Foreign Reporting in 2016 for his Ocean series. And a pleasure to have him rejoining us once again. Ian, welcome. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Great to have you with us. Uh, So why are the oceans forgotten about regarding these rules and laws and as you say with the with the subtitle of of the book the last untamed frontier i think they're forgotten for the reasons you cited um foremost geography it's just such a huge space uh it's also sort of far removed over the horizon from the rest of us land lovers it's very expensive to patrol so even when there are good laws on the books 
Uh, there's not a whole lot of enforcement of them. And then typically the crimes that occur, at least against the people um, that work out there, uh, are crimes against people that are largely from the developed world and um, don't tend to have advocates or lawyers sort of on their behalf. It's a very under-unionized um, the international fishing industry is very under unionized, so they don't have that representation. So, for all those reasons, um, it's very low policed. So, we'll get to the people in a second, but as you mentioned from the geography side, there's so many countries that are attached to different bodies of water, it, it makes you think, well, which country is actually, actually responsible for which body of water? And especially when you get further out into, into the deeper oceans. Yeah, so I think, like you say, you've got um, on the high seas, so past the 12 or the 200-mile mark, depending on your definition, um, that is a space that belongs to everyone and no one, and so jurisdiction is murky. You know, wh- whose responsibility is it if someone is murdered out there um, to investigate and to prosecute? In what court does that crime go? And then it gets even more entangled when you look at the realities on these vessels, the ships are typically uh, flagged to one country, maybe owned by a company in another country. Most of the crew might be from a third country. The captain and officers are from a fourth country, and that vessel is traveling through international space, so international um, uh, terrain. And so when something goes awry or someone is missing or there's an abuse of some sort, um, it's, it's rarely clear who would do anything about it if anyone wanted to. You start out the book uh, re- re- relating a story uh, of a group of people working on a fishing boat near uh, Cambodia. And, and the first thing that caught my attention in that story was you mentioning a boy who was working on the boat who was missing two fingers. And that talks to, obviously, the conditions, but it also says about who's working on some of these boats. Yeah, so I think um, the conditions first, you know, if you think of this as a uh, developing world factory where you don't have the sort of OSHA amenities, um, you know, safeguards on the on the factory floor, and this factory floor where there's all this industrial equipment runs 20 out of 24 hours a day, um, the, the floor is skating rink slippery. Um, The factory floor moves up and down constantly, you know, sometimes 30 feet, you know, um, uh, and you've got heavy machinery running at all times. So it's a dangerous place, slippery. um, There's tackle and and jagged gear all strewn over the place. Um, And then on top of that, as you said, the demographics of the workers, um, to a large degree on this order of ship, these long haul ships, um, you have boys and men, many of them trafficked, so they, you know, their passport, if they even have one, is taken away. Um, they may have a debt to pay off, so they're debt bonded. Um, so um, that adds to um, the vulnerability of this workforce um, in an already pretty dangerous setting. Can you, can you get an idea of, of how much of the fishing industry right now involves people that, that may be considered slaves? always perilous to try to put a number on, you know, anything from a dark economy because right. it's dark. Um, I, I uh, so I, I wouldn't be able to do that. I think um, the vast majority of fishing is not this, is not um, sea slavery vessels. Uh, on the other hand, there are huge areas. So the South China Sea, as you mentioned before, that water near Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and Thailand, you know, has on the order of 40, 50,000 vessels, and a large percentage, I would guesstimate over half, are dependent entirely on trafficked migrant workers, um, especially in the Thai fleet. Uh, now, move that same general reality to other hot spots of this kind of labor, so off the coast of the Falkland Islands, uh, near New Zealand, um, uh, West African coast, uh, near Somalia, there are a lot of these vessels. Uh, and you're not talking about a small number of vessels or people that are affected in this way. But it, it, then it does bring up the issue of something like wages for some of these people and making, you know, a, a very small sum of money uh, for being out on a boat for two, three, four weeks at a time. Yeah, I mean, the reality of the industry in the last three, four decades is that um, 
what was already a thin margin industry, fishing, long haul fishing, um, as fish stocks have disappeared near shore and ships have had to go much further out um, uh, to break even, the profit margins, if there are any, are razor thin. And that has meant that wages have fallen through the floor. Uh, and there's been this large shift to migrant workers because they're the only ones willing to take these jobs. Um, and so, yeah, so point one, even if you are paid, the wages that are paid for this kind of work are um, shockingly low. Um, but the other issue is quite often these guys um, uh, work for a year and then are lucky to get off the vessel if they're migrant workers, probably in some third country, and make it yeah. home. And while they may have been told that their wages were being wired back to their village, oftentimes they get there and find out that not a cent was actually being sent home. You also talk about some of the pieces of equipment that are that are being used, especially in something like the fishing industry, like different types of illegal nets that are being used by boats. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, there, there's, there are various types of fishing that used to be commonplace that are now seen as... Um, highly destructive, usually because of bycatch, meaning they're 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 netting fish that are not your target, but that but they are killed in the process and just thrown overboard. And so these are really wasteful ways of uh, capturing prey. And um, many countries have sought to ban those sorts of nets, gill nets, or or uh, bottom trawling, you know, things that are super destructive to um, what life is down there on the ocean floor. Um, But again, without police, um, rules are only as good as their enforcement, and um, it's it's very difficult and rare that um, any of this stuff is ever uh, uh, implemented. 844-942-7866. If you'd like to join in with your comments or questions, we are joined by Ian Urbina, who is uh, author of the new book, The Outlaw Ocean, Journeys Across the Last Untamed Frontier. Again, 844-942-7866. Or if you'd like, send us a comment on Twitter, at BizRadio132, or my Twitter account, which is at DanLoney21. Obviously, one of the things we've you've talked about and we've talked with you about in the past is the treatment of the oceans and and the illegal dumping that that continues to go on and is is a significant problem around the world yeah i mean the the statistic that bubbled up with help from some academics um uh, that really struck me was that every you know there's been a lot of attention um uh, to spills, the BP, the Exxon Valdez, etc. These are tragic incidents for sure, but they get a lot of press. Um, but truth be told, intentional dumping um, is far more pervasive and, and ultimately destructive, you know, to the tune of every three years more oil and sludge is um, dumped into the ocean intentionally by ships, usually through a magic pipe, you know, that disappears them underneath the water from the engine room. Um, more oil or sludge than the Exxon Valdez and the BP spill combined. And and this stuff doesn't biodegrade, it doesn't dilute, um, it just accumulates and is part of our massive um, uh, plastic uh, pollution problem that, that is um, unfolding in, in the sea. What is the what is the expectation that we should have in terms of trying to to be able to deal with a lot of these problems because of the fact that it is such a large area that is that, that has to be policed that has to be looked at and the fact as we said before that there there isn't one body that is really you know taking a deeper uh, deeper responsibility on this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think the first step is to not think at too high an altitude and think, you know, on the order of how do I solve injustice? Um, that's a question that's unanswerable and um, is best, you know, to step away from it. If you lower the altitude and ask, okay, if this is a book about a diversity of crimes, murder, stowaways, arms trafficking, human slavery, intentional dumping, illegal whaling, overfishing, all these various things, the better way to engage is to think at the altitude of, well, which of those problems speak to me most and and um, can be tackled. Um, all of them can be countered by a couple of meta solutions, better tracking by governments, you know, sort of requirements that usually are going to be legislated, that if fish is ending up on plates 
or products are being shipped across the waters, then the ships that are engaged in this market need to be um, complying with certain basic rules, independent you know, license plates. Um, they need to have their transponders on at all times so they can be seen. There should be crew manifests. There should be labor contracts, etc. Mm-hmm. And these things can be imposed by countries if there's political will. And probably that will occur not by governments alone, but by pressure from the market. So consumers that don't want to eat things for which there's a higher chance that there's slavery or illegal fishing involved, and they they begin buying, even though it's more expensive, other products that seem to have more accountability in their supply chain. Um, Those sorts of market pressures will also drive change um, uh, as led by governments. And 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 also, the last thing I'll say is journalists and and NGOs have a role to play in just continuing to shed light on what's happening out there. And and because, uh, going back to your your point on the public, uh, I think there are probably people out there that are that are very much concerned about a lot of these problems, but they maybe don't necessarily think about them when they go to the restaurant and, and they order cod or they order some other ty- uh, other type of fish. Uh, so the, I guess the question is how do you, how does the public really put more of this type of pressure on entities to be able to to start to police this type of activity? It's a good question. I, I think. I think how it happens is like how does social change happen? It's like a big question, right? And in this case, I think it's um, it's probably there's a lot of attention shows like yours and newspapers and sustained attention on the problem. People begin to hear about it, and then those people work at organizations or in government and other places, and. Um, solutions begin to emerge. There's bad press that comes by way of, gov- of companies that are involved in, in, in things. Um, people begin looking for solutions. There are solutions that are out there. Um, Monterey Bay Aquarium, for example, has a long and quite rigorous um, tool that's been around for ranking safe from unsafe fish, mm-hmm. um, etc. The, the, the tools are out there, but people need to be um, interested and go looking to give them guidance on what is uh, better to buy or worse to buy. Um, and I think gradually, with enough sustained attention on it, people begin to make some of those purchasing decisions. And advocates also then lean on big um, stakeholders that buy in bulk, right? So if Uncle, Uncle Sam, the U.S. government, is a big purchaser of fish, for example, yeah. um, the EU is a big purchaser of fish. Um, and if pressure begins to mount that as a bulk purchaser of something, we want to make sure that you comply with these sorts of concerns and are safeguarding against them, that begins to affect the market in a big way. We're joined by Ian Urbina, who is the author of the book, The Outlaw Ocean, Journeys Across the Last Untamed Frontier. Your comments are welcome at 844-WHARTON, 844-942-7866. Or if you'd like, send us a comment on Twitter at BizRadio132 or my Twitter account, which is at DanLoney21. One of the the other things that, that you see occurring uh, because of the fact that you have the, a level of piracy is that you see more and more of these, these ships that are out there that – have to have a component of being armed, uh, you know, to have the protection that they need when they're making a trip from from one continent to the next. Right. Yeah, I think there was a reckoning with that, uh, sort of an upswing in that problem, 2008, 2010. Um, you know, Captain Phillips, the movie, you know, put this on all of our um, sort of uh, public um, consciousness. Uh, it has ebbed and flowed as a problem off the coast of Somalia specifically, but um, it, this, you know, violence of this sort, sort of banditry, um, occurs off the coast of Bangladesh, occurs off the coast of Nigeria. There are a, bun- a bunch of other places where it, it is fairly in widespread. Um, you know, the, the story of Somali piracy, though, is really interesting and to some degree loops back to an earlier point you made, which is that, um, you know, because the target of that type of crime were deep-pocketed players, you know, yeah. international oil companies and Maersk and, you know, major players with huge insurance policies. Um, there was pretty definitive and effective action. The industry came together with governments, um, coalition forces put, you know, armed vessels in the region, an entire industry emerged, a $1 billion industry of private security guards began 
you know, um, to emerge and be on these ships. And it really actually reversed the problem to a large degree. And it sort of goes to the fact that when there is political will, in this case driven by deep economic consequences, um, a lot can change pretty fast. Um, so I, I do think that when you hear from industry types that, oh, well, the shipping industry and the fishing industry are disparate and there are too many countries involved and we can't get along and we can't agree and we have competing interests, we can't do anything about it, this whole sea slavery problem, I say, well, boy, when you guys were getting hit by Somali pirates, in nine months you fixed that. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I do think they can if, if there's enough pressure. Well, and, and it's almost like they, in this one particular area, uh, they forget about how much of an economic component they have in a particular ship. And, and right. it, I, I'm, I'm stunned that it actually does occur, but I know firsthand from talking from family members who have worked on ships that there are times where they have to be, they have to be carrying a pistol or they have to be carrying a rifle of some kind to make sure that they are protected on their boat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I, I think, again, it has to do with the victims of the crime are different. Um, in sea slavery, the victims are people that um, uh, uh, are, are generally invisible people, and so the clamor and reaction is anemic. Um, when it comes to the crime you and I are talking about now, uh, these are people of means and of political leverage, and um, th- that's why there's um, a clear response that's occurred. Do you think there is a way, that, and, and obviously we are starting to see more interest uh, in the concerns around the waste that is being uh, dumped into the oceans by 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 companies, by countries, et, et, et cetera, but do you think there is a way to be able to potentially loop in all of this other illegal activity if we tie it to the concern that we have for the dumping that we see in our oceans, maybe one leading to the other. Mm. Well, this may be a stress, but I do think there are some solutions that will probably benefit uh, or counter all the problems. So the ones I cited before, like the requirement that every vessel, planes are not allowed to fly country to country and be in international airspace and yep. not be known, right? You know, there's like an international um, sort of system in place for ensuring that that doesn't happen for all of our shared collective interests. Well, similarly, but, but that's the opposite in, in, in the shipping domain. And the fact that boats can and routinely go dark um, means that crimes like dumping or illegal fishing or human slavery are very easy. Um, so countering the dumping concerns um, uh, and countering the violence concerns and the illegal fishing concerns um, are not fully solved by requiring that all ships at all times are publicly um, monitored. Um, right. But it's a big step in the right direction. Um, now, truth is, the biggest problems at sea when it comes to waste are problems that start on land in the form of landfills that are too close to the shore and yep. plastic pollution that ends up getting in rivers and flowing into the, the oceans. And that's an on-land problem and has to do with you know, policies, especially in Indonesia and China, um, uh, in terms of um, uh, waste management. So it's, it's, it's wonky and boring, um, but the plastic pollution problem... Uh, and then upstream from them, who's producing the plastic in yep. these disposable forms in obscene quantities. Now, that's a problem that you and I have complicity in for sure, you know, yep. as we order stuff from Amazon, et cetera, and it comes in disposable, overly packaged stuff. That's all plastic that has to go somewhere, and it often ends up in the ocean. You've uh, you've obviously been uh, covering this story in one form or another for, for several years now. Obviously, the reporting that uh, appeared in The Times, in The New York Times, and now with the book. Uh, how has all of this reporting even changed your mindset around a lot of these issues? Um, I think it uh, made me feel more guilty, <laughs> you know, about you know, the luxurious life I live and what are the wh- what it what are the hidden costs globally that contribute to my luxury. Um, I think it made me more aware of that, um, uh, just on a personal consumer level. Um, so it, I don't know if you're you're thinking on this altitude, but just I also. Um, uh, it did impact my dietary habits a bit, and I okay. don't, you know, 
And I don't I don't want to advocate. I'm not advocating for others. You know, this is not my place as a journalist to tell people what to eat or what not to eat. But I, I personally don't eat seafood or meat um, uh, f- partially um, uh, driven by some of what I saw in the last five years of this reporting. Right. I, I guess the disappointing thing when you when you think about it in, in general is that there are versions of, of the problems that you are seeing out on the oceans that are still occurring on land in countries yeah. ar- around the planet. And, and I, I guess to a degree that if we can't solve the problems on land, how should we expect to be able to, to cure them in the seas? Not that, that you know we want to try and go ahead and do that, but still one, unfortunately, is leading to the other. Yeah, and, I, and I, think, I think what you say is quite true. I think the reverse is also true in that there have been – really um, impressive um, developments uh, in a lot of these areas. So on the issue yep. of human rights and labor, sure, there, there, are, there are egregious things happening in factories all over the world yep. all the time. Um, but the, the ability for those things to happen and the accountability when they're revealed um, is very different than it was 30 years ago. Right. Uh, and and it's it's also very different than the, the state of affairs at sea. So I think um, some of the lessons we learned on land, uh, dolphin-free tuna, sweatshop diamond, I mean, uh, blood diamonds, you know, sweatshop-free garments, you know, these supply chain moments that through history that have changed matters are ones that we should study for the sake of um, trying to clean up things at sea. Ian, thanks very much for your time today. Again, good luck with the book. Uh, Great job over the last several years, and uh, all the best to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ian Urbina. The book is The Outlaw Ocean, Journeys Across the Last Untamed Frontier. Uh, The book is available in bookstores and online for your purchase right now. He has done some some very deep and and strong work uh, in this area over the last many years and continues uh, to uh, really do quality content uh in this area all right we will take a break final 30 coming up in just a minute Uh, when we get back underway we're going to talk about some of the issues surrounding immigration and immigration policy and the impact on the economy uh what would certain changes to immigration policy actually mean to things like gdp or employment or even just population in general we'll talk about that next sirius xm 132 business radio powered by the wharton school